Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Seattle Angel workshop series that we do. We're in the process of running up to our 23rd Seattle Angel Conference. And when we do that, we run a series of workshops aiming to help startups make more progress and also to help new angel investors figure out what it means to invest in a new startup. And so we're doing workshops every um, Tuesday and Thursday at this point, working on things. And we've noticed uh, a bunch of um, new motions in the market around uh, no code and AI plus no code. And so we thought we'd add some of those into our workshop series. We have Zubar here working on uh, that as part of his regular um, program and services. So we'll dive in deep with him in a second. Uh, hi, everyone. Zubair here. So I've been in the world of no code for around three years now, and it has definitely changed my life. And I'd be, I'd love to kind of get straight into the talk. I think I have a slide which covers my bio, and that's a bit of an introduction. So I'll defer the intro part to the slide. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And let me know if you see it easily now. Yep, looks good. Looks good. All right. Okay. So thank you very much, John, for having me. And uh, I love talking about no code. Always happy to talk for hours and hours. But I'm going to try and keep this uh, short uh, and then have a lot a more kind of interactive. Uh, feel free to ask me any questions, however long you want, and go from there. All right. So we're here to talk about uh, startups with no code. Uh, thanks for the background and the intro. I have a good feel for this is a more founder centric. There are some angel investor investors as well, but it's more kind of founders and startup founders. And uh, I'm going to try and steer in that direction a bit more. Right. So from idea to product without a single line of code, it's possible. All right. So a little bit about me. My own background is a software engineer. And now I avoid software engineering. I don't say I avoid software engineering, I, I avoid coding it. So my own background was not in web. It was more in kind of like embedded devices like your Wi-Fi router or your TV, the, the software that runs inside there. So I couldn't really make a web-based platform. Uh, and that's when I came across no code just before COVID. And uh, I was like, okay, no code, I'm gonna start learning it build an agency around it. The original plan was that I'm gonna learn it by consulting in it and then build my own thing. And then this no code agency became the thing and it's been three years of running and I'm definitely enjoying it. So I've got a team uh, building startups for founders around the world, 17-ish uh, folks, a mix of product managers, user experience experts, developers, marketing operations. And we've worked on like 50 plus web apps. Uh, most of them are entrepreneurs looking to build startups. Some of them are businesses that are looking to automate processes. They have something off the shelf where it doesn't really work. It's a bit clunky. So they're like, okay, we'll just make it, uh, make an in-house. Uh, they didn't have the budget to go full code and maintain and everything, but they, have, they were at the size that they could invest in a no-code solution and that helps them scale further. So that's uh, there. these do definitely, there are enterprise players in the no code space, but definitely the vast majority are startups. And then there are some SMEs. So a little bit of an outline, we're gonna explore what is no code. We're gonna look at VC funding in the space. Uh, we're gonna look at what can easily built without, be built without code. Uh, why no code is useful for the next startup business or investment and an example scenario. Uh, that we come up with, okay? So what is no code? It's an umbrella term for the overall ecosystem. Uh, it was a tricky one because a while back it was like, okay, visual programming, do we call no gives a bit of a negative connotation. Let's call it visual programming or sixth generation programming or still call it programming. But no code is the term that is now pretty much mainstream-ish. So you don't have to be a programmer or coder to make custom software or web platforms. And the an analogies I like using whenever explaining it is that it's like Lego for making web applications. And, or would you like to make a shed uh, by cutting down trees and chopping the wood and then make the shed? Or are you just going to the supermarket B and Q or whatever it is equivalent, wherever you are, uh, buy the panels and just build the shed or 
purchase pre-built, pre-cut shed blocks and just assemble it kind of thing. Uh, the end goal that you needed was the shed. It was not, I want to learn how to chop trees and cut wood and build panels. And then what you needed was a shed. Would you like to farm by hand or a tractor? All right. So no code is just like sits on top of code. It's not like it's built without code. There is code under the hood, but it lets you work faster. What's the difference between like a tractor and farming by hand? You can still farm but a tractor can cover acres and acres way faster, way cheaper. So no code platforms can like basically the, the tractor driver is the no code programmer. The tractor is the no code platform and whatever problem you're solving is the whole farm. So you can go farm like by hand, it'll just be slower. You'll need 20 people, it'll go be slower and you can have one tractor no code platform, one no code programmer and just kind of mow the whole lawn if the landscape allows it. A lot of flat land will allow it. If you're in mountains, not allowed. So there are limitations. It's getting better. The limitations are less and less now, but that's a good analogy. So is it a new thing? Not really. So Microsoft front page in 97. So 1997, there was like visual drag drop, Dreamweaver, WordPress, you could technically, technically argue is a no-code platform, kind of the, one of the originals, which kind of went mainstream. You have loads, loads of plugins. You can cobble together a very lovely job board, a marketplace, a community, a forum. You can do a ton of stuff with WordPress. Uh, Wix, Squarespace, you can do a ton of stuff with them. Then what next? All right, that's where we are right now. Okay, so why is it all the hype now? Okay, so fundamentally, what is a web application? It's a mix of design, data, and logic. Okay, so what are you what you're looking at right now on the screen? Let's take this slide deck. I'm looking at the slide. It's a text element here. There are buttons and icons at the top. If I click something, some logic happens. And if I change something, save something, some database change happens, okay? So I've got front-end design elements, then I've got some logic that what happens if I click, what happens if I move this around, what happens if I click here, then I've got some database, it's saved in the cloud, okay? Now, traditionally, you needed wizards or software engineers to kind of work this together to come up with something, all right? And that's where it's changing. If you look at the previous platforms, front page, design heavy. WordPress, Wix, Squarespace, design-ish heavy. WordPress, you can extend with some custom plugins, but the custom plugins were still coded by people. So, but it's still design heavy things. Now, however, logic and data are also being poked at and you can work in logic and data without code, or you can work in the combination of them without code. And that's where it, the hype is all here now. So, and the platforms are really good enough now. Okay, they existed, but they're really good now. So anyone can use no code to build software. So this particular slide, it's like, it, this, it goes a lot because it kind of conveys, these are all the different platforms. It's okay if you don't see the acronyms, that's fine. But generally speaking, there are platforms which are design heavy. You see Wix somewhere over there, okay? So you'll see Webflow somewhere, yeah, design heavy. Then there are platforms which are automation logic heavy, Zapier, Integromat, some other flow unit or like other, they just take data in and do something data out. You'll see data platforms which are data heavy, Airtable, spreadsheet, something, smart sheet, spreadsheet, web, Airtable, no, they're just data heavy. And then you'll have overlapping ones, all right? So if you get design plus logic, you get a bit of both. If you get design, logic, and data, now that's where it's like, okay, there are few who operate in all three spaces. Bubble is one of them. And that's the agency, that's the platform we kind of use primarily for building startups because it can do a lot more. It can do design, logic, and data, and you can build complex stuff using Bubble. So we've done a few others as well for clients. And there's loads of kind of use cases which fits design logic or design spreadsheet or other combinations. 
as at its core, we kind of just prefer Bubble because it's like a Swiss Army knife of no-code platforms. So like, okay, throw anything at it and it can pretty much handle it. So now for founders, why use no-code? A, I think I've missed the uh, biggest one, which should be the first one. You can learn it, okay? Uh, I've recorded YouTube courses, uh, boot camps, and you can spend this upcoming weekend and you'll know a lot of no code. If you spend this upcoming weekend on code, you may be able to throw a pop-up or print something, okay? If you spend this weekend on no code, let's say five hours, five hours, 10 hours later, you'll be able to do a lot, okay? Now, rapid prototyping and evaluation of ideas at a fraction of the cost, speed of learning much shorter, spend time where it matters, matters in customer feedback, UX, faster route to market, you just tweak, adjust, iterate quickly. And if you're stuck, you can inject code in it. It's not like, oh, I'm stuck. It's like, oh, that's it, end of the line. Nope. Let's just go into code. We need some specific special configuration here. We worked with a Web3 uh, platform a while back. Most of it was code. It was like some logic components. We were like, it's just gonna be too hard to make it in bubble. Let's just write, I think it was like 20 lines of JavaScript code because why not kind of thing. We could just inject it in the right place when needed. All right. So, but speed of learning, I'm gonna emphasize this a bit more. So I've taught boot camps with bubble. The boot camp for Bubble was eight weeks, two hours of live uh, instruction every week, and of course, asynchronous. You have to do some work. If you compare this, this and this will take you from nothing to a Bubble beginner. And some founders I saw were like building really complex stuff by the end. And if you compare this with a coding boot camp, you need three months full time to become a junior web developer. Three months full time. This is just eight weeks part-time and you're done. If you do eight weeks full-time, you're like really way at it. So now for investors, what's changing in the landscape for no code and what's up? There are definitely more niche, smaller SaaS appearing in various verticals. New founders are appearing as well in many verticals. There are definitely uh, loads of people I've spoken to corporate manager, eight, nine, 10 years experience, very experienced in their industry vertical and have an idea. The idea is may not be big enough for a billion dollar exit, but it's a really good ARR, MRR possible. It'll solve a particular problem for a customer profile and generate value. And they have ideas, they come across no code, they try and learn and implement it themselves. They, these are people who've never considered themselves as founders due to budget constraints, or I need a team, I need an accelerator, I need to raise a million, and then it's a startup kind of thing. Or, well, you could just spend a couple of weekends learning it, a couple of weekends trying something, go to market. So the route has changed a lot. Previously, the route was way different for MVP. Uh, a lot of solo founders are appearing. And I've ha I have clients who've asked me, can you be the second guy on our pitch deck? <laughs> because we're like, whenever I go, they're like, is that, is it just you? <laughs> and then uh, the, and that the conversation quickly goes downhill because they're like, no, you need a team kind of thing. So like, but like, w w and they're like, I'm like, fine, just put my face, I don't mind kind of thing. And I tell them, it's like, you, do you have users paying you? <laughs> that solves all of these conversations. <laughs> like if you have, like if you show up with, I've got 2000 users paying me $50 a month, VCs will kind of like, okay, fine. Like the team part kind of, there's product market fit here kind of happening. So let's talk more. The, oh, you need a team is correct. I hear why they're saying it for the cold way. You needed a more product person, a tech person who's more Cody, a marketing, a CEO, founder. I totally get that. But for no code land, you get solo founders all the time. Okay. And they are facing pushback from angels or VCs. And a little bit of juice in their idea will give them that push to potentially leave their job and go full time at it. 
but they just don't have that or go full-time marketing or just ideate more product. I have a few clients who are like, okay, they left their jobs because the startup is gaining a bit of traction and went three days freelance consulting, three days, two days. It's just about it. And they've spoken and exactly the person coming to mind is the one, one of the, the people who asked me, can I put you on the pitch deck kind of thing? So solo founders are definitely happening, especially at the early stage. So that's for investors. Now, in terms of VC money flowing into the no-code platforms themselves. So Thunkable, uh, you can make mobile apps with it, 30 million. Uh, Softer, 13.5 million. Bubble, 100 million. That's what we use a lot at ASCII. Uh, Webflow, that's Webflow, yeah, hit 4 billion valuation. So a lot of VC money is going into the platforms themselves, definitely, okay? Now, in terms of startups built using no code are also raising funding, okay? So Coins is a mobile app, uh, raised 1.5 million, deal, job search, 5 million, uh, agile freelance, IT talent, 13 million, dividend finance, solar something, raised 300 million. Now, these are startups that used no code. I mean, there are lots of companies who use no code in their side thing, but Coins, the core app itself is built with no code kind of thing. That's the platform built because of no code itself. Uh, there are other startups as well. So each platform will have startups and users built using, so the, the previous one was Bubble, this is softer. So case studies, startups built using no code. Uh, there's definitely loads of nonprofit work going on because the, the, the budget they have and the results they need, they, they definitely have problems. They just don't have the budgets to throw at custom software agencies to maintain and do it, but they have the budgets and they have the enthusiastic people. So there's lots of that happening as well. And there is, uh, like you, you may, at the moment, I'm not aware, there will be, uh, one of the conversations I had with one of my clients was, he was like, can you not put us on your website as testimonials? I'm like, why? And uh, it's because I don't want VCs when I'm fundraising to know that our startups built with no code kind of thing. <laughs> so there will be more out there, but it's just a hidden kind of thing. It's just not, we're not cool yet <laughs> kind of thing. So, but that doesn't mean that the value isn't there. The value is definitely there. And this problem is only just gonna keep going away. The more success stories there are, it's gonna ju just kind of spiral out from there. So. Now, what you can easily build with no code. Marketplaces, we've built loads of them. SaaS, we've built loads of those as well. I won't say all SaaS, but definitely some SaaS. So for example, something like Google Slides, basic one possible, a very feature rich one, bit hard, but there, we have built SaaS. Dashboards for like aggregating data, all doable. Social media, uh, this one actually got into BBC. If I, you guys are seeing my screen, right? Not real Twitter. So, uh, hmm. SEO magic is not that good. Not real Twitter. I believe that was the name, wasn't it? Not real Twitter.com. So yeah, they built not real Twitter without code. And uh, it got featured quite a, while back in BBC that, what do you mean Twitter without code? I think this is like five years ago. And uh, it's like, you've got the left panel, the tweet, the feed happening, the follow, lots of good stuff happening. Uh, you can open, see threads. And this, this they've made this V2, but V1 was five years ago without code. So I was like, oh, wow, this can happen. So social platforms, definitely job boards, definitely business tooling very specific, definitely we've built internal project management stuff with loads of business tooling can happen. Scheduling tools, uh, definitely. So there's the easy scheduling tools like Calendly and like use cases which off the shelf scheduling helps. But then there are uh, specific specialized booking scenarios which the off the shelf tools didn't, don't cover. Uh, we built one for a dog training company and they have a, a small group lesson with a senior trainer and a junior trainer and up to three dogs. 
uh, booked and a, a certain type and this, you just can't take off the shelf wordpress or something for this scenario so you they either need a full ops person admin person to just coordinate the schedule or just like accept bookings on the phone or they were like okay we'll just build something and we built something for them so client portals loads and the list goes on you can build a lot with no code a couple of platforms which i like and keep an eye on and recommend uh airtable so if you have anything data heavy spreadsheet on steroids like you're, you've got a database of like 15000 something and you want to add some filters and kind of show it as a directory so airtable and software lovely combination if you want to pick the easiest one to learn at the moment even though i'm a bubble enthusiastic fan i'd say software is probably the easiest one to learn and it's ideal for some use cases uh, if you want to connect different platforms zapier or integromat make.com now uh, are really good uh, if you have design heavy websites webflow would be the one uh, if you want to make web apps like interactive design logic data i want a button to click to do something to save in the database and both bubble is the one and if you want to go mobile apps thunkable uh, or adalo would be the ones to look at so that's about platforms and some uh, favorites uh, but there's loads of platforms there's the enterprise heavy ones which are like microsoft power apps i think out systems, Mendix, and there's definitely the, these are all the consumer-ish, consumer and low price, easy ones. There's definitely the enterprise uh, ones as well. Power apps is, is one example. So now I'd like to run one example startup idea and scenario and just how to think about a no code tech stack, okay? Because that's what it's slowly becoming. It's like, okay, what's your tech stack or C++, yada, 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 no. What's your no code? tech stack and you get the equivalent in a no code kind of combination which solves the user's problem because at the end of the day what problem are we solving who are we solving it for the platform is just a channel kind of thing it, it could be like a person on a phone call solving the problem and that could be the ideal solution <laughs> to that problem okay so amazing startup idea tweet assist dot ai so since we're AI and no code, they're all just AI, like especially with chat GPT is like kind of taken over the world by a storm. Uh, I'd like to build an AI tool that summarizes my blog into a Twitter thread for the company Twitter account, all right? So we've got loads of blogs and material on our website and we've got an SEO agency. Now we just want to grow our tweets. So I'll just, here's a blog, make a Twitter thread, post kind of thing uh target audience is smes solopreneurs whoever just has blogs okay and they want to take that blog to twitter uh, they just don't have the bandwidth for dedicated copywriter in-house or external or anything so it's going to be a simple subscription-based pricing uh individual plans company plans monthly annual now a few years ago you'd be thinking oh this is definitely cold land and it's just going to be silly amounts of money uh, you need loads of engineers to build it. Now, not silly amounts of money, not silly amounts of time. It's all buildable easily. Also learnable and buildable. And that's a big USP as well. You can learn how to build it in a relatively shorter amount of time as a skill and then actually build it and then go live. So basic set of features, you've got users who sign up, copy pastes the blog content, the app just returns a Twitter thread. The user tunes the Twitter thread and adds it to the queue. The app posts the Twitter thread at the right scheduled time on the company Twitter account. All right. So in terms of number of no-code platforms, uh, we need we can pick two. Okay, for the tech stack, we've got Webflow. So our front-end slick marketing website. We should make in Webflow. It's like okay, explaining the idea for twist tweet assist.ai and you've got pricing blocks and whatnot. The actual core platform, use Bubble to build it. So whenever you click sign up, you go to app.tweetassist.ai, that's powered by Bubble. And you could sign up, log in, the subscription, any API integrations. The next API integration you need is with OpenAI, and you need an API integration with Twitter as well. So all this 
doable stuff. Uh, sign up, login, that's so like boringly easy in Bubble. Uh, Stripe subscription, there's a plugin for Stripe, easy as well. The plugins for OpenAI, I personally like direct API calls because I can tune the API call, but I wouldn't worry about the term API application programming interface or passwords. There's loads of tutorials out there in the previous world without no code, without a coding background or engineering background, you'd be completely stuck. You won't even get into sign up or login, let alone Stripe subscription, let alone API integration. Now this is just boilerplate easy stuff, 10, 20 minute tutorials and you're done. Stripe subscription, spend an hour, two hour learning, an hour, two hour kind of implementing, you're done. OpenAI will spend a bit more time how to cobble it together and how to make it work, but it's still learnable, makeable. So within, I think this image is covering it, an advanced no code person, a very bare bones looking one, few days. If you want looking more polish, few weeks and uh, you can go live kind of thing. And that that's where I think the harder part comes in where like, okay, now to market it. <laughs> so some of our kind of like uh, people who are working in the jobs and uh, they found us and like, okay, can you build this idea? And we build it for them. And then the energy fizzles out <laughs> because sales and marketing is hard stuff and it's a long grind towards, okay, we went to talk to users, they want X, let's, tune this to be X, change product market fit and whatnot. So the idea, the, the, plat, the idea they had in mind did get implemented. They went to market, didn't have the, maybe it didn't work. Maybe they didn't have the energy to push through the marketing. And we've had some who just kind of phased in the middle as well of the build, but that's life. So if you're convinced and you want some more links, uh, MakerPad is lovely nocodefounders.com is a very active Slack community. Uh, I'm like our ASCII, our kind of, our agency is very bubble heavy and my background is very bubble heavy. So we've got bubble specific resources. One resource which I'll highlight specifically. So if you Google Python developer roadmap, you'll see a roadmap to become a Python developer or web developer roadmap. I learned this, 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 this kind of thing. And you're kind of, you're a, this developer. And I knew about these and I was like, what if there is a bubble developer roadmap? Okay. So what would that look like? And that's where, okay, you, you have a non-technical background and you want to kind of step-by-step -step learn, become a bubble developer and make it. And it covers like, no code, lots of helpful links, bubble.io, lots of helpful kind of links. What is it? UX and product design, lots of helpful links about personas, persona mapping, user stories, wireframing, prototyping, and a little bit about UI, uh, how to make things pretty responsive stuff to make it like web mobile databases. People really get afraid, but it's not that hard. You just need deep work blocks to learn it as a skill. Logic and workflow, debugging, going to production. So it takes you from nothing to a bubble developer to make your own kind of startup yourself uh, if you want. So that I believe is at the very end of my presentation. So thank you very much. I hope you guys learned a lot and enjoyed. Uh, I've, I'm active on LinkedIn, Twitter, slightly less active on YouTube now. If you're a founder looking to build their startup, uh, if you know a founder looking to build their startup, please introduce us. And my email is there. I'm always available. Any questions? Anyone have any thoughts? So uh, Zubay, thank you for the yeah. presentation. That was great. My, my only comment would be, a lot of startups they they build things whether it's no code or no or gone through the longer process of doing coding itself they often don't go through the process of finding product market fit first they have an idea they think you know the old adage of build it and they shall come is is true so you know what do you do for 
for your clients, you know, when it comes to product market fit, what, what framework do you apply? You know, what sort of success rate have you seen with it? Uh, so I'll, I'll go on mute because uh, I'm curious. So uh, lean startup is a good methodology. Whatever we like, I recommend to clients is like less. That, that's the biggest problem I usually have because they're so buzzing with energy and ideas and this huge platform and this huge feature rich and lots of users. And I'm like, we have a zero users problem. That, that, that's the biggest problem of this startup right now. So anything that does not solve the zero users problem is an extra feature, okay? So laser focus on the customer persona profile and then laser focus on the problem. And if you can't explain it to me in our 30 minute <laughs> kind of introductory call, you kind of need to do some homework and then come back. It's, it's either painfully obvious and it should be buildable in a small amount of time. So it's easy for us to like, oh yeah, we'll just build it for six months. So in no code land, that's a equivalent two years worth of dev and a complicated something, but no. So follow the lean startup methodology. You have a hypothesis that this type of persona suffers from this type of problem that they're willing to pay for. The simplest solution for this problem, X. Like it could be very simple like dangerously simple with zero bells and whistles. Did they buy it? And then let's build more and more and more later. Uh, it's harder to convince passionate founders about this, by the way. <laughs> Imp impossible yeah. as far as I can tell. Impossible. Um, so the, the framework for the lean startup that we use is the four steps to epiphany by Steve Blank that came, that's a, or the original book in 2003. Um, but I try to map that onto the Lean Canvas by um, Ash Moria, and he introduced the Lean Canvas with the uh, running Lean book. So I put a bunch of books into the chat. Um, if you understand that customer discovery is customer problem fit at the beginning, and you're not building the product, you're building the experiment that validates that this person is an early adopter that has the problem that is psychologically ready to engage in paying money to solve the problem so that you know who a customer is first, that there's someone who's willing to pay to solve the problem. And then you start asking them if the solution so actually solves their problem. That sort of like step two problem solution validation work, right? Getting founders to do that is really, really difficult. And we, we tend to point people at the Tom's hardware example of building a content site where you talk about the problem as a mechanism to collect people who care about the problem, which is much like what Yohei Nakajima is doing with his um, build in public effort, and much like what Zubar is doing with his efforts to um, tell people about the process so that you find people with the problem. And now we can talk about what things solve that problem. And the no code gives you a way to build a much more rapid and deep experience around the problem in the beginning, which you can then move, go on to build the solution later. Yeah. Manu, you had a question that you were um, going to ask? Actually, he has answered in the comment section. Okay, cool. Uh, other people? Yes, uh, Ramiro. Yes, thank you, John. Hey, Zubair, so uh, even though John already hinted to, to this, but let me ask you to see if you could further, uh, further develop. From an investor point of view, what are the, the new set of leverages that an investor should try to use now in, in, in the world of no code? And, and the opposite, uh, in, you know, question in the opposite direction. What are the new challenges that investors should be aware of with uh, the uh, increased use of no code by, by founders? So as an angel, and I'm gonna speak more from the angel investment position because series B, C is different set of challenges. We are talking about early stage startups. The uh, new areas you're getting, uh, it'll be solo founders. 
I think that will differentiate a lot. There'll be solo founders with potentially smaller total addressable market sizes. Okay, so they may not be a oh, billion dollar startup with huge TAM, huge opportunity kind of approaches. It'll be smaller market sizes potentially, but they'll, they'll be profitable and generate value quickly. And the exit places potentially are in uh, platforms like micro acquire uh, as like, because lots of uh, kind of, it's uh, now they've changed names from micro acquire to acquire.com because not just micro acquire, uh, but that would be what I, I would say in terms of like from an investor perspective, you're looking at solo founders and smaller TAMs and smaller MRR ARRs. So the multipliers for exits may be similar, but it's smaller kind of ticket sizes for entry and smaller exits both. So the traditional VC route is like, okay, we'll just spray money and we're looking for a unicorn to pump the whole syndicate up. Uh, that in the world of no code, it, that philosophy I don't think will work successfully. Uh, you may find more success in that, okay, we're gonna uh, look at a particular industry vertical. That's where the, that's usually what the founder brings with them. So they have that industry vertical expertise that they'll bring that to the table. The no code platform is just the channel that they'll you know, use for problem solving delivery. And the problem they may be solving will be specific and maybe smaller. There are definitely the traditional billion dollar VC problems that you can try and use no code to solve as well, a marketplace for X or Y and whatnot. But I'm talking about like new wave of kind of founders, which is solo. In terms of risks, there are two. There's definitely the hit by a bus problem, but that's standard for any kind of team or anything. But then you've got like a solo founder running the whole ship, at least at the very early stage beginning. Later on, they can graduate to become a different situation. But at the, at the very early angel stage, it is a solo thing. Uh, the other is, which is usually less of a problem, but people do think it's a problem, the platform risk itself. So it's like you're standing on top of a particular no-code platform. How robust is it? What's their community size and what's their user base? How much funding does it have? So I'll give an example. We built a, so in fact, two mistakes we made at our agency. And I was the one who made the mistakes. <laughs> so I suggested a very new upcoming no-code platform to a client that, oh, Bubble's not suitable for this, but we're gonna use X platform. It's got these YZ features and we'll build it. We started the journey and very quickly realized uh, this platform is just not mature enough kind of thing. So it may have the X, Y feature, but it's just not mature enough. So there is still a risk. It may cross the threshold and be mature and will be fine, no risk, but it may be that, okay, it starts winding down and you have to kind of then move to a different no code platform or just go code, it depends. If you've got product market fit and money, money coming in through the door, you can solve the no code platform problem very quickly. You can kind of solve that the platform can be rebuilt. You, you own the data, you own the users, you own the subscriptions, the tech is the less of a problem then. So that's what I would say, but it's, the risk is slightly similar in the world of code as well. You can you have these upcoming Amazo new stacks and frameworks, and then the framework doesn't catch on kind of thing. You can't find devs for the framework, and you're left with like legacy code very quickly, even though it's a startup. Oh, we brought in shiny new 10x engineer who used this shiny new library, but the library is not maintained and has security glitches in it anymore. And the 10x engineer has left who knew how to do it. So it's the same risk kind of thing. Uh, with no code platforms, you get a different style of risk. So. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it, that was super helpful. Now, just to uh, to follow up on that, will it, will it be safe to say that with, with this explanation you, you mentioned the, the leverages and, and the challenges, and uh, what I understood was if I want to oversimplify it, that it's a similar set of challenges in a no core world, except that now for both for the investor and for the founder, 
the process has been democratized. Now, now you have the opportunity of a lot more investors, you know, instead of competing with the big VCs that are chasing the billion dollar ideas, now investors can also, you know, look for returns in, in and, and be a, a, a higher percentage of the investment fund in, in smaller, but also profitable investments or potentially profitable on the one side. And on the other side, you also have as a, as a founder, the same risk of the platform risk, but again, like you said, you are in, in a huge company, you rebuild a huge uh, you know, uh, uh, tech stack. If you are in, in a small startup, you rebuild you know, a, a, a no-code platform. Is that fair to say, or, or is there something that I'm missing in this opportunity? Yeah, 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 definitely. So there's definitely gonna be more opportunities, more startups, the scale, will be like maybe smaller ticket sizes, better for angel investors that there's uh, more angel investors can enter at that ticket size into companies at those scales. And there will be the equation, there will definitely be a no code unicorn as well. And somebody's gonna make a lot of money on those <laughs> kind of thing, some angels. Uh, and on the other side, so more recently, what I've seen is may maybe in an ideal world, no code as a term just dies kind of thing like because it's just like code no code doesn't make a difference kind of thing <laughs> like it's about the startup the customer this problem the traction the business the fundamentals like do you really care if something's built with javascript react or python or angular or bubble It'll, over time it's like doesn't matter kind of thing it's more about the user the problem the solution the traction the business is it working so this like uh at the moment it's a it's a topic of discussion eventually it will not be a topic of discussion but it will open and definitely democratize because uh previously it was just way more complicated and expensive to make a startup and now the barrier is just like easier and lower kind of thing. So, so more so the, founders, more startups, more problems being solved, more opportunity for in investors at smaller sizes. And at, because of the smaller sizes, more angel investors as well in the ecosystem. So the, it's important to, offer my, to sorry, two questions in there. One is, you can't do the normal angel investing where you're expecting the venture funding to come in later. So the deal terms on the investment will have to be fundamentally shifted and you need to look at a revenue-based finance or some other mechanism for exit because the probability that the exit for the smaller company um, goes big and goes public or gets acquired, um, it changes. So there's, there's a yeah. difference there. On the other end, you have the ability for competitors to come in very rapidly. So that barrier to entry before kept a bunch of other people out because they were fighting in the swamp and couldn't get over the threshold. But now other people can do it too. So instead of having a hundred other companies that are working on the same problem, now you have a thousand other companies working on the problem. That means that you as a startup need to be so much better and so much attuned to your customer development and customer engagement that if you don't you'll be overtaken by someone else pretty quickly and make that go yashar you had a thought yeah i, I was going to say as an early stage startup your number one goal is to sell 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 like it doesn't matter if like some people might think about no code, is it going to be scalable? And I've heard this from investors. Is your platform that you built, is it scalable? Is it not scalable? But does, it really doesn't matter. The way that we look at no code or these easy to create prototypes aren't that they're going to be there for the next five, 10 years. This is simply there to be able to sell your product to your customers, your first initial evangelist to buy into it. They start using it. You then have a product market fit. You then prove the, the model. And then you can start thinking about, okay, now that I have money coming in, I can start investing into building the platform, make it more robust. So I can go out and I can raise money from, you know, series A and beyond to be able to build the more robust platform. But there is no, 
I mean, even if you look at the existing platforms out there, they're, they're never the, cha- the same as they were when they started. You know, you look at uh, Snapchat or Facebook, they're not the same as they were six months ago. There's a, there's a constant evolution. It's never stagnant. And so to look at no code as a potential, oh, this is not a starter that we should invest in because they're using no code. I think the, the mindset should be more like, is this group of people are they actually, have they found customers that are w- willing to shell out money for this service or product? And if the answer is yes, then you have to think about, okay, is this going to be scalable in the, from the perspective of, will others join in and buy into it? Do they have a lineup of customers and just can't keep up with demand? If, if you check those off, then yes, I think it's a good investment. But if they have no sales, it doesn't matter if it's the coolest thing since sliced bread that they've developed. I, I wouldn't invest in a, in a company like that. Those are just my two cents my, from my experience. Alicia, I see your hand up, or I see you leaning in. No, all right. Romero. Yes, uh, at what point, uh, uh, question uh, for, for both Subair and, and, and Yashar, and, and maybe, uh, I don't know, John, you can also chime in, but uh, at, at what point do you consider um, uh, the, the need of, of building a more robust non-code platform. So let's say like Yashar said, so you already proved the concept that you can find customers looking to shell out money, right? So so at what point after that, and then you, you raise uh, Series A money, right? The fact that, that you raise Series A money doesn't mean that, that you should spend it in, in, in another tech stack. What are the, the flags that tell you this is the time to, to leave aside no code and go for for a more robust so tech stack. if you're thinking about um, simple Amazon in server instances, and you think about what it would take to have this piece of code on that server intra- instance and how many users you can support on that at one time, and then you figure out what percentage of your total user base is using that one server at one time, my system administration experience says, I could easily support, I don't know, 15,000 people at one time on one of those servers. That, that's how much power is there in the gigabytes of stuff for most of the simple things that we're asking them to do. Um, and so, you know, and let's suppose that I'm only getting 10% of my customers. So I might be 150 customers where I go to the website and I go click and it gives me a little bit of data and I charge 10 bucks or 15 bucks a month. The load on the server is low and this is one box, right? So now we take one box and we put it on a cloud and now that ability to do that thing is, you know, order order hundreds of thousands of people without too much trouble, right? And I haven't really done anything significant in this. So it's really not until you start having um, control issues with your infrastructure stack that you need to worry about that. And then the question becomes, which particular stack doesn't have control issues? And so it, it will, it, it, <laughs> you may fully be able to get past series A without having to worry about that at all. But there's a point at which the risk of that random change by Google in the middle of their stuff, which they give you no control over, where you decide to bring it in and stabilize the underlying thing so that somebody else can't blow up your product. You know, yeah. is, that, is so, that a reasonable answer, Zubar? Yeah, that's totally a reasonable answer. And that's what I was about to say. It's, it's an engineering decision. I don't think it's a CBZ decision. It's an engineering decision uh, that, okay, we've got 20,000 users. Uh, we can go up the bubble enterprises dedicated plan and actually go for a dedicated AWS server, max it out, and it will work till 100,000 users based on what we do. So it there's the CPU server, how much coins can you put into the server to scale it? Then there's the architectural, okay, figure out the specific bottleneck that's causing that load, can we architecturally change it or optimize it within the same platform? Or, okay, let's add a touch of code here because we're gonna optimize this. Like the no-code platform is more like a Swiss Army generic knife. And we've reached the scale 
where we need a toolbox kind of thing. And the first tool that we need is a particular type of screwdriver. So we write that bit in code and put that in the middle of our tech stack and kind of smoothen out that bottleneck. So it's not a today tomorrow transition kind of thing. It's like there's a hybrid phase in the middle and you have to figure out the bottleneck. It's an engineering decision, not a, oh, we have money. Let's kind of move away kind of thing. Uh, if you have like push it in marketing, sales, product market fit, uh, yeah, push, push in that direction. So it's more engineering driven. Yeah, just wait for the demand. And then once the demand is in, then build for it. If the demand isn't there, you know, in the architecture, the demand is there from customers. It's, it's a waste of uh, capital and resources in my opinion. So when, when we're trying to get people to do customer problem fit work, and we think about the education app for the 13 year old girl, we ask the question, who's the customer? Is it the 13 year old girl or the parents or the grandparents or the teacher or the principal or the education department at the school or the school district or the federal education people or the nonprofit that wants girls to do STEM? All of those are potential customers that would pay for the girl to use the app, but then the problem they're solving is different for all of those. And so if I'm at an early customer discovery phase where I'm trying to get to the point where I have the app and I have a customer paying me for that person to use the app, then I have to run my experiments against all of those, right? And the way that I run my experiments is a content strategy where I talk to a bunch of people. I do workshops, I do white papers, I call people on the phone, I stop people in the street, whatever mechanism to reach that subgroup of people and tell them the problem story and see how they react to the problem story. So I'm gonna do 15 different websites with 15 different problem stories to 15 different submarkets. And then I'm gonna discover that one of those outperforms the other ones it, it happens faster, they pay me more money, there's a lot more of them, whatever the decision is, I'm gonna pick one of them, but I've just, you know, I threw away half of them because they were noise, they didn't do anything. But of the other half, some of them did something. And so what do I do with those other ones? Well, one of the things I can do if I built a no code solution to draw in that group of people to explore that question that I was trying to solve, is I can use the acquire.com website and sell that content business. And so now I can monetize my early customer discovery experiments. Because yeah. the ones that were sort of half successful, they have value. I spent a lot of marketing research. I got names and phone numbers and emails and money from a bunch of people. And having that and selling that to someone else can be really quite useful. This is what I call the Luna research story. They put dirt into fiber. They could make sensors for health sensors. They could make sensors for bridges. They could make sensors for environmental pollutants. Which one should they do? Well, they did all three. They set up sub-children companies that did those three things. They still do the fiber research because that's what they want to do, but their children do those other things. Now, they didn't have to maintain control over the children companies. And you as a startup also don't have to do that. So often founders think that they have a solution and that solution works for all possible markets, which is provably false. You cannot market to all markets. You have to market to sub markets. And so the, the no code solution that has audience that's big enough to be paying attention to, but not big enough to keep your attention for the growth company you want, you can package them up and sell them and be done with them and get revenue to drive your growth in the one you care about. It comes down to the TAM, isn't it? it the TAM may not be enough for series A, B, C, anything, but it's still a profitable business a problem that there are people willing to pay for. So especially with the recent recession and recent, there's definitely way more focus on profit and actual revenue uh, compared to the climate before, uh, where it's like, okay, just grow, build, acquire users, wherever. Uh, but yeah, the time may not be enough, 
but it's still a profitable business. And why not have the founder um, take that profitable business and turn it into momentum for his other business instead of just throwing it away, which is what they normally do? Yeah. Are, are there other questions or thoughts that people would like to explore? Okay, I'm not hearing any. I would like to suggest to folks that if there are non or no code solutions you would like to learn more about, um, we will try and schedule workshops on them. Feel free to drop me a note for that. Ramiro, you had a hand up, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, John, uh, and, and this is something that, that maybe you, you can you can shed some some light here. So with with the lower barriers to entry, uh, uh, you know, and 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 all these solopreneurs like Zubair you mentioned, right? All these solopreneurs coming, and this might be more of a tactical question, right? Uh, so from an investor point of view, uh, what are things that you know that tactically you are Change, you're changing in, in terms of evaluating deals. So, so if now, if before you evaluated a hundred deals and now you're evaluating a thousand because of no code allowed for that. So, what are things that now, from an investor point of view, become more relevant tac tactically? You know, to to be able to to handle that that increase uh, uh, flow, th that lower barriers to entry to, to manage all these volumes. Well, I would really encourage you to look at the work that Yohei Nakajima is doing on his build in public effort, the yohei.me website. Let me put it in the chat again. Um, he has a um, uh, process where he can essentially go out and grab a bunch of companies, filter and sort them, and basically give himself a lead list for the companies that are all somewhat cooked. So of the thousand companies he's looking at, he doesn't actually engage with a whole bunch of them because they've already been cooked because of his no code program. So he's functionally looking at fewer companies, even though the in input to his funnel is much larger. And so I think that that, that would be really useful um, for, for people to be doing. More importantly, at the Seattle Angel Conference stage, most of the people coming in don't do what Yashar was paying attention to. They do not do customer development and have a core group of people that are paying money um, and are excited about the content process of the customer discovery side, let alone the product that they're building, right? That, that flow has not started because they've been building the MVP, which is not really the MVP, how Eric Reese used it. It's the crappy solution that this is all I could get together, which is not viable. It's not a viable product. And so what you want to do is to run the series of rats, the riskiest assumption tests that go through and, and in, invalidate your bad ideas by running these tests, right? And you run that enough and you monetize that. So you have a group of people what startups are doing that? Not enough. And so because I'm now reaching out to thousands instead of hundreds, I would expect that I will find more that are doing real lean customer development, which would then be my bias to invest in that kind of company because they're reducing their risk by a factor of four by finding the customers who care to pay now. So that's, that's what I'm hoping will happen. I don't know if that's really what will happen, but that's what I'm hoping so, will happen. Because it should be relatively trivial with no code to run experiments that are monetizable. You you sit down at your startup weekend and you go blah, blah, blah to your AI and poof, there's a member, mem membership site and you type a bunch of content into that thing and you get yourself 1,500 people that paid you 10 bucks by the end of the weekend. That's a signal. You should do something with that signal. That is that is entirely possible now, where yeah. that was not possible a year ago. What, what the only tidbit I'd add to that is that uh, there is a term now that no code is the fast fashion of startups. So you'll definitely get drive by startups kind of thing or drive by MVPs and uh, customers. That, that's the real thing like how much focus is on the customer persona profiling, the product market fit, those discussions, uh, solving the problem uh, and real revenue. 
So you'll get like super, like, oh, amazing MVP with loads of charts, dashboards, features. They won't matter. The features won't matter as much now because the features are cheap. And it didn't used to matter either, but it would like kind of look like, oh, there's so much engineering R&D cost into coming up with this feature. But now it's like, okay, do you have paying users kind of thing? Where do you find them? Do you have a marketing channel that works? And what's your kind of, what problem? How big is the market? Do you have a marketing channel? What's your moat like? Those things, which were true before as well, which were totally true before as well. So there's three numbers that I think founders should be chasing and that investors should be looking at, which is revenue, week over week growth and revenue, and bounded cost of customer acquisition. If you get those three things, right, and and they're 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 tight, predictable at some level, you're now at some level of product market fit. And then you can worry about what's the TAM and what's the go-to-market strategy and the other parts that are dependent on those. But if you can't figure those out, it doesn't matter if you have a great go-to-market strategy. It doesn't matter a whole bunch about the channels because you don't have a bounded set of costs that you can manage. So we'll start looking more at what, what Zabur was talking about and more at the data that's being collected along the way. Um, Sarah, uh, the three are that you have revenue, right? But revenue is not enough that you have week over week growth in revenue, which specifically I think should be somewhere between three and 5% week over week growth if you hit customer problem fit and a bounded cost of cu customer acquisition. So, you know, if I spend this $10, how many customers you're going to get? If you if you can't predict how much money it takes to get a customer, you do not know your market well enough. Yeah. Any other thoughts or commentary? Well, let me encourage you to take a look at the other workshops. We have a whole bunch that I think will be useful, including a pitch workshop coming up in February. Um, we will continue to do the Thursday ones all the way through May. Um, and so there's a whole collection of opportunities there. Please do follow Zubir on uh, Twitter and learn about his uh, roadmap and all the things that he's working on. That, that would be a, a good thing to do. And thank you so much, Zubir. That was great. That worked very well. Thank you. Now, uh, Sarah wants to know how much the boot camp is. Uh, did, uh... I don't do them anymore. Bubble doesn't do them anymore. I was a Bubble Bootcamp instructor. It was, it used to be $800, uh, but there are loads of paid courses. Uh, email me or the roadmap has loads of free courses and paid courses. And the, the YouTube one I have on Bubble is free. So. Cool. Cool. Thank you so much. Appreciate you all coming. All right. uh, Thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Zabir, thank you. John, thank you for putting this together. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much for this session. Thank you.